Hello, Calvary Chapel, Albridge. My name is Stephen Chudkowski, and I have the blessing of being able to provide this weekend's Sunday School lesson for your children, April 16th and 17th, and it comes from 1 Kings chapters 19 through 22, and it will continue the study of the life of Elijah, the prophet. So, just as last week's lesson had so much information, this week's lesson has so much information. So, we have a lot to cover. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that there are resources that you can download off of this uh, lesson, and it will help you to remember and learn um, what it is that we talk about today. I would also encourage you, if you could, pause the video, take five to ten minutes, read through chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, and familiarize yourself with what it is that we'll be talking about today because it's a lot of information. Afterwards, come on back and we'll go ahead, we'll pray and we'll begin. Welcome back. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you that we can come together in your name and that we can speak about your word. We ask that as we read, we discuss, these things, that we would be built up in our faith, that we would see the times that we live in today just as they were back then, that we would see that your people need to wake up and we need to have our hearts turn back to you. We ask that you would breathe fresh and new your spirit on us, that you would revive us, that you would give us a revival fire, that we might not only believe but we might be on fire in our belief. And we might just help to kindle that fire in our family, our friends, our neighbors, all around us. Because we know the time is near and you're returning soon. Bless this time. Speak to our hearts. It's in your name we pray it, Jesus. Amen. So guys, just as last week, we talked about Elijah the Tishbite. And He was sent by God to confront Ahab over his idolatry. And one of the main reasons that Ahab was involved in so much idolatry, and idolatry is the worshiping of idols, anything other than the one true God, but worshiping other gods. And uh, Ahab, who was the son of Omri, who is the king of the northern tribes of Israel. Remember the southern kingdom, right? And then the northern kingdom, 10 tribes here, two tribes here, because remember, Simeon is embedded inside of Judah. So uh, Ahab is king over those 10 northern tribes. And Ahab takes the wife, as wife, a daughter of the king of Sidon. So Judah, Israel, Sidon and Tyre would be up here. Damascus, Syria over here, but Sidon and Tyre up over here. He takes a daughter of the king of Sidon as his wife. Now, this is the same thing Solomon did. And God's word said that you were not to marry foreign women because they would turn your hearts away from God. This is the very same thing that Balaam taught Baleg to do to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Remember? And Balak hired Balaam to curse God's people. But he couldn't because they were blessed because of their faith in God. They were God's people. And when you're God's people, you can't be cursed. Right? Not when you're you're obedient to him and you're following him. But Balaam wanted to get the money from Balak. So he said, here's how you get them. I can't curse them, but you can bring God's judgment upon them. Go ahead and send some of your daughters down to dance in front of them and to marry their uh, the Israelite young men and send some of your sons to marry the Israelite young women. And then once they're married, get them to worship your gods and you'll bring God's judgment upon them that way. And that's exactly what Bele did. And um, and this is the same thing that happens here. So Ahab marries Jezebel. Jezebel is a foreign um, 
woman, she's not an Israelite, she's not a Jewess, and she worships other gods. She worships Baal, and she also worships Astarte, also known as Asherah. And this is what happens in Israel. And you learned last week, God sent Elijah to say, let's settle this thing in Israel. Let's settle who God is. And he said to Ahab, send the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Estarte that eat at Jezebel's table, send them up to Mount Carmel, gather all the people together, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to see who God really is. And you remember what happened. They both prepared a bull for sacrifice, and they weren't allowed to put fire to it, and each one was going to call down fire from heaven. And the God who answered with fire was God. And you remember the prophets of Baal and Astarte. Elijah said, because you were many, you go first. And from the morning right through the noon, nothing happened. And they started to dance and sing and shout and yell. And they began to cut themselves, a demonic activity. And nothing. And then Elijah rebuilt an altar with 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He set the sacrifice in its place at the time of the evening offering. And he then had them bring 12 large basins of water after he dug a moat around the altar. He totally deluged the water over top of the uh, sacrifice so that it was soaked with water and all the water just built up in the moat around it. And then he prayed and he said, Lord, let them know that there is a God in Israel. Turn their hearts back to you. And as he prayed, fire came down from heaven. It consumed the sacrifice. It dried up all the water. The people fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, the Lord is God. And then you know what happened. They took all of the prophets of Baal and Astarte, and they brought them down by the brook, and it was there that Elijah put them all to death in accordance with God's word in Deuteronomy chapter 13, that anyone who would cause God's people to worship another God or would tell them something that God said that would lead them to worship other gods, they were to be put to death. And um, that's exactly what happened. Now, Ahab, after seeing this, and then remember the rain comes, Ahab, after seeing all this, he should have went back home to Samaria. He should have proclaimed to all the people of Israel, the Lord, the Lord is God, and there is no other God. And we need to repent, and we need to fast in sackcloth and ashes for all of our sins, and we need to seek him. That didn't happen. Instead, he tells his wife Jezebel what happened. And Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah that basically says, May the same thing happen to me that happened to my prophets if you're not dead by this time tomorrow. When Elijah hears this, this burly man in animal skins in a a leather belt, he basically runs for his life and he flees from the northern kingdom into the southern kingdom of Judah and he goes to Beersheba in Judah and there he's hiding from Jezebel. And while he's there, he sits underneath a tree and he basically says, Lord, I'm no better than my father's. At this point, I just would like to die. He's depressed and he's anxious and he doesn't know what to do, but he does pray and he lays down and an angel wakes him up, an angel. I wonder if he knew it was an angel, probably, but an angel wakes him up and says, eat and drink. And Elijah gets up and there is a cake of bread on hot coals and a jar of water. And he eats and he drinks and he goes and he lays down to rest. At some point, the angel wakes him up again and says, eat and drink, 
for the journey ahead of you is too long and you won't be able to make it basically if you don't eat and drink and nourish yourself. So Elijah does just that. And he is told to go to Mount Horeb and to wait for God there. Now, Mount Horeb is also known as Mount Sinai, the very mountain that Moses went up on and saw the burning bush that was not consumed, where God spoke to him and said, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. And also where Moses brought the people after they left Egypt and he went up and received the Ten Commandments. Remember, he was up there for 40 days and for 40 nights. It just so happens that the journey from Beersheba in Judah to Mount Horeb slash Sinai in Midian will take Elijah 40 days and 40 nights. And when he gets there, he goes to basically sleep in a cave. And while he's in the cave, God speaks to him and says, go out to the mountain for I'm about to come pass by you. And as Elijah goes out to the mount, there is a mighty wind and the wind blows and it's blowing rock and stone and it's breaking rock and stone. But God's not in the wind. Then there is a quake in the mountain shakes and God is not in the quaking of the mountain. And then there's a great fire outside on the mountain. But once again, God is not there in the fire. And then there's a still quiet voice where God speaks to Elijah. And God says to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah says to God, I have been zealous for your name. You know what just happened on Mount Carmel. He says, the people of Israel, they have broken your covenant. They have rejected your laws. They have killed all of your prophets. And only I am left. Remember last week, Obadiah, who was the uh, head of Ahab's household? He hid 50 prophets in one cave and 50 prophets of God in another cave and gave them food and water to protect them because Jezebel was not only pushing uh, idolatry by worshiping Astarte and Baal, but she was also killing all the prophets of the one true God. So Elijah has correctness in what he's saying, but they didn't kill all of God's prophets. But he says, they've killed all of your prophets and only I am left, Lord. And God says to Elijah, Elijah, there are 7,000 in Israel in the northern tribe area that have not bent the knee to Baal, nor have they kissed him. Now, bending the knee means they've subjected themselves to him, to Baal. They're following what he does and what he says. But kissing him is a sign of affection. It's a sign of love. So he's saying there are 7,000 who have not either followed nor have nor loved Baal or Sarte. God says, I have reserved these and these people love and follow me. That's who we want to be, right guys? We want to be those who love God as it says in Psalm 2, kiss the Son. We want to kiss Jesus. Yes, when we see him, but even now, when we pray, when we're doing our devotions, when we read his word, we should love him. Okay, so God now says to Elijah, here's your marching orders. I want you to go all the way from here in Midian, all the way north up to the area of Damascus in Aram. And I want you to go and I want you to anoint Hazel king in Aram. Now the king there right now, his name is Ben-Hadad. And then he says, number two, I want you to go and anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, king in Israel. Now, Ahab is king in Israel right now. And then number three, I want you to go find Elisha. 
Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, the son of Shaphat. And you're going to anoint him as the new prophet in Israel. He's going to take your place, Elijah. Something special is going to happen with Elijah. So, Elijah is obedient to God and he goes off to do this. Now, in the meantime, lots of stuff is happening. The king of Israel is being besieged and attacked by the king of Aram. And Ben-Hadad has come with 32 other kings or princes and their armies. And they're coming against the northern tribes of Israel. And God sends the prophet to Ahab. Now, once again, to prove to Ahab that there is a God in Israel, that there is a God in Israel who is alive, who speaks, who has power. And he basically says, I'm going to deliver this whole vast army you see into your hands tomorrow. And Ahab says, how? How will this happen? And and who will lead the army? And, and how how do I go about this? And the prophet says, set the young princes uh, in the front and let them lead out the army. And they do that. And as they go out to battle, uh, Ben-Hadad and his 32 princes, they were drinking wine. And, you know, they're basically, when they're told, they're like, hey, overconfidently, go and take them. If they're coming out for peace, take them alive. If they're coming out to fight us, take them alive. So what happens when you drink alcohol? You don't think straight. And the young princes and the people of Israel begin to strike them. And they start to defeat them so that the army of Ben-Hadad and all those who are with them, they're on the run and there's great casualties. So they go and regroup. But the prophet, the God says through the prophet back to Ahab, prepare yourself, strengthen yourself, because they're going to come back against you in spring, in the coming spring. So Ben-Hadad gets together with his counselors and they say, listen, their God is a God of the hills. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and fight them in the valley. I mean, it's almost comical. It's kind of like the thinking that people have today with uh, the foolishness of evolution and, 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 and the gods they worship. Anyway, they say, because their God is a God of the hills, we're going to fight them in the valleys. We'll defeat them there. God sends the prophet to Ahab and he says, because they say that I am a God of the hills and not of the valleys, you're going to defeat them in the valley. I'm going before you. And sure enough, but he also told um, Ahab that you are to strike down all of the people of Aram and you're to strike down their king, Ben-Hadad. Because a new king is going to be anointed and he's going to be Hazael. So uh, they go ahead and they have a mighty victory. The people of, of the northern tribes of Israel against Aram and all of his army and all those who are coming with him. And uh, the king of Aram, Ben-Hadad, he's hiding and he says, listen, we hear that the people of Israel are merciful. Let's go ahead and give ourselves up and perhaps they'll be merciful to us. And sure enough, they come out and King Ahab says, you are my brother and we'll have a treaty. And um, Ben-Hadad says, I'm going to give you back the cities that my father took from you and you can have your uh, markets in, in Damascus and we'll be friends. And that's not what God said. And if you remember, King Saul, the first king of Israel, was told by God through the prophet Samuel, when you go against the Amalekites, you are to not only utterly defeat them, but you are to make sure that you kill every beast of burden, all the animals, the people, and also Agag. Because God said, I remember what they did to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. How they attacked those who were old and who were at the end of the, of the, uh, the long line that, that was coming out. So Ahab doesn't do this. So 
God sends a prophet now to say to Ahab, because you haven't done this, basically, life for life, your life is going to be taken. Life for life, people for people. Not only is your life going to be taken because you didn't take Ben-Hadad's life as God directed you, but also the people of Israel are going to suffer tremendously because you didn't wipe out your enemy when God gave you the opportunity to. So, in the meantime, lots is going on, guys. So in the meantime, uh, while Elijah is going to do these things he was told to do, there is this vineyard that is owned by a man named Naboth. And it's near Ahab's, um, his uh, capital, his house, his residence there in Samaria. And Ahab wants it. And he wants to buy it from Naboth, but Naboth won't sell it. So he comes home and he's all upset and he tells his wife, hey, I wanted to buy this from Naboth, but he wouldn't sell it to me. So Jezebel goes ahead and she plots to have Naboth uh, put to death for blaspheming. Now, this is a false charge, but it's a plot. It happens. They accuse Naboth, some unruly people. Um, they accuse Naboth of blaspheming both uh, the king and um, when he they do this, they take Naboth out and they stone him to death. And then uh, Ahab takes his property. At this point, God sends Elijah back to Ahab. And he says, you have slaughtered an innocent man for his vineyard. He says, judgment's coming upon you and you're going to pay for your sin. And not only is judgment going to come upon you, but you and everyone in your household is going to die. Dogs will lick up your blood by Naboth's vineyard. And the dogs will digest your wife, consume her body um, in the streets of Samaria. So, heavy words. Ahab does... Uh, repent in a way where where he puts on sackcloth and ashes but he doesn't turn from his idolatrous ways now meanwhile uh elijah goes and he anoints hazel uh king over aram he goes ahead and he anoints jehu king over israel Jehu is going to go ahead. Now, Jehu is one of the army uh, captains in Ahab's army. And uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat, who is the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, they have a confederacy. They come together. Jehoshaphat basically gives his son, Ahaziah, to marry the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Her name is Athaliah. They uh, marry, and so they have like a, a, a political wedding that kind of unifies their friendship. And um, Jehoshaphat is later uh, convicted of doing things like this, where the prophet comes to him and says, why do you hate those who love God? And why do you love those who hate God? And uh, Jehoshaphat, even though he's a very godly man, he's not always thinking wisely in what he does. Nonetheless, Jehu, he's a captain in the army of Ahab, and he turns against Ahab. Uh, first of all, Ahab is killed in battle. He, go, he and Jehoshaphat go in battle against the king of Moab, and during this time, he is struck with an arrow, and he is killed. Uh, King Jehoshaphat survives um, because God's grace was upon him, even though he was not doing a smart thing by being there with a wicked person. Um, but Jehu, Jehu comes forth now, and Jehu is going to go and he's going to kill Jezebel. Actually, when he comes to uh, Samaria, 
Jezebel's up in a tower and she accuses Jehu of basically treason and mutiny against his king. And uh, Jehu calls up and he says, if you're for the Lord, throw her down. And they throw her out the window. And when she hits the ground, she dies. And uh, then he goes in to eat. And while he's in eating, dogs come and they basically consume her body. Only certain parts are left. And I know that's a harsh thing to hear, but it's nonetheless, uh, because of their depth of wickedness and their depth of sin, you, you, you see that their ways of the judgment upon them is, is heavy. So nonetheless, Jehu, he's zealous for the Lord uh, because God has told him through the prophet to go forth and to wipe out all the prophets that are left of Baal and Astarte. And he goes ahead and as he comes forth into uh, Samaria, he's now king and he says to those, he says, Ahab worshipped uh, Baal a little, I'm going to worship them a lot. And he gets special garments for all the priests and he tells them to put them on and they're going to have a big ceremony to worship Baal. And all the priests who want to worship Baal and false gods and he says, you know, come, we're going to worship them in one of the temples, the false te the temples that worship these false gods. Meanwhile, he tells his army, anyone who's wearing one of these garments that the false priests have on, any of them that escape, it'll be your life for theirs. So he goes in and he pretends to worship. And then he basically, when they're all there collected in one place, he calls his army to come in and they start to slaughter all the false prophets. Again, bringing God's judgment against these false prophets. So Jehu will go on to become another king in Israel, the northern tribes. Jehoshaphat, he has a son named Joram. And uh, Joram is not a good king. Remember, uh, Joram, the son of Jehoshaphat, is going to be married to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, and her name is Athaliah. And um, Joram, when he becomes king, he kills all of his brothers to secure the throne for himself. Now, again, he's the king in the southern kingdom of Judah after Jehoshaphat dies. Uh, Joram has a son, um, Amaziah, and he is not a good king either. And he gets killed, and when Athaliah, his mother, sees this, she goes ahead and she kills all of her son's children, and she declares him herself to be the queen slash king, the ruler over the southern tribe of Judah. And uh, there is a young man who is saved by the providence of God, who was a son of um of Amaziah, and his name is Joash. And um, later, he's hidden in the temple by the priests, and he'll be raised there until he's old enough to be brought out and made king in place of Athaliah. She's put to death. But this is pretty much where our story takes us today. It's a lot of information. I think the important things to remember are, number one, we're talking about a man named Elijah. From last week, he was a man that God used to start to wake the people up and to turn their hearts back to God. And God shows himself powerful in a mighty way through Elijah to show the people that he's God and no one else. And then we see that rather than Ahab coming back and doing the right thing and, and telling the whole nation, We've been wrong. I've been wrong. We're worshiping idols. There is a God in Israel. We need to repent. He doesn't do that. Instead, his wife, Jezebel, 
wants to kill the prophet of God, Elijah. And so we see that there's going to be a transition from here where Elijah is going to transition to Elisha. Elijah does go and he finds Elisha, the son of Shepat, and he puts his cloak on him. And basically that means, come and follow me. You're going to be my understudy, my next in line, so to say. And Elisha does follow um, Elijah. Eventually, Elijah is going to be taken up into heaven. We'll talk about this next week. Uh, in a chariot of fire. He is one of the two men that were not told died physically. Uh, the other 10,000 Pastor Gary points for anyone who can remember what his name is. It is Enoch. And Enoch was the fifth from Adam um, all the way back at the time of Noah, before Noah, but around the time of Noah. And Enoch, we're told, walked with God, pleased God, and God took him because God was pleased with him. So Enoch never tasted death. Elijah has not tasted death. We know that Elijah is going to come back. Just as he went into heaven, we're told that he would come back in fulfillment of the prophecy in the book of Malachi. In the last chapter of Malachi, we're told that Elijah the prophet will come and he will begin to turn the hearts of the sons back to the fathers and the fathers to the sons. He says, lest the Lord strike, and basically turn their hearts to God, lest the Lord strike the land with a curse. And um, we know that John the Baptist came before Jesus in the power and the spirit of Elijah. But Elijah is yet to return before Jesus our Messiah returns for judgment. In Revelation chapter 19, there are two witnesses who during the tribulation, that final seven year period of this age, and one of those witnesses who comes from heaven, his name will be Elijah. There's much debate about the other uh, witness. Some people think it'll be Enoch because he never died. Some people think it'll be Moses. There are even others who are uh, offered as potentials. But nonetheless, Elijah, he began to turn the hearts of the people back to God. Unfortunately, Ahab, Jezebel, um, they don't, they don't follow God. They don't, they're not taken in by what God has done. And again, important lesson, if you're a young Christian man, you don't date, you don't marry a non-Christian woman. And if you're a young Christian woman, you don't date, we don't do missionary dating, you don't marry a non-Christian man. Rather, if you're a young Christian man, you look for a a uh, very virtuous Christian woman who loves God with all of her heart, who will bring you closer to your faith and relationship with Jesus, and who will be a blessing to your children, should the Lord tarry, and vice versa. If you're a young woman, you look for a strong, on-fire, young Christian man who has an established walk with the Lord, and someone who's going to draw you closer to Jesus, and someone who's going to not only uh, be your partner in life, but who's going to help raise a family that will honor God. So, nonetheless, um, next week, I have to inform you, will be our last Zoom teaching. Uh, you want to be here for it, and I'll be giving it. And we're going to uh, continue to talk about Elisha. And um, I would also just uh, say that... Um, it will be our last Zoom meeting for Sunday school, but everyone is welcome back at uh, Calvary uh, Church. Uh, we have Wednesday evening service, we have Saturday evening service, and we have our two services on Sunday morning. Okay? The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. Thank you for this opportunity to have been with you and to have done this. Uh, I'll look forward to talking to you next week. God bless you.